Russia has deployed a new battle tank in Ukraine, but according to the United Kingdom's defense minister, it's faced delays caused by a slew of manufacturing problems, making it unreliable. Quote, if Russia deploys T-14, it will likely primarily be used for propaganda purposes. Production is probably only in the low tens, while commanders are unlikely to trust the vehicle in combat. Mm. Speaking at the UN this week, Russian Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov and issued a stark warning that the world is at a dangerous threshold and that risk of global conflict is greater even than during the Cold War. Here he is taking a swipe at the International Monetary Fund, alleging it works to further U.S. global hegemony. Clearly and openly, the International Monetary Fund has morphed into a tool for the achievement of the goals of the United States and their allies, including goals of a military nature, in a desperate attempt to assert domin their domination by punishing in their insubordinates. The United States has taken the path of destroying globalization, which for many years they have taunted, they have uh, raised up as the highest benefit of all of, human uh, of humanity. Here to help us parse through this latest development related to the Ukraine war is Max Blumenthal, editor-in-chief of The Gray Zone. Welcome, Max. Good to see you, Brianna. How are you really, doing, Robbie? <laughs> I really appreciated your commentary uh, throughout this last year plus of the Ukraine-Russia conflict. Help us make sense of what's going on. First, let's talk about um, these battlefield developments. What should we know or understand about the weaponry? And perhaps some you can elaborate on what context we should have learned also from the leaks of last week or the week before and whether or not they have, sh have changed the dynamics on the battlefield at all. Well, I'm more of an American typer than an American sniper, so I'm not really a military expert, but it's my understanding that the battle raging between Ukraine's military and Russian forces in the East, specifically around Bakhmut, is really a stalemate that's being waged with mines laid out across defensive fortifications in which tanks aren't really effective and play mainly a symbolic value. That includes the uh, American M1A1 Abrams tanks that never really arrived with the German Leopard tanks. It doesn't look like they're gonna be uh, much of a battlefield factor. Uh, and you have right now, all of this pressure on the Ukrainian military to wage a counteroffensive. But as we've seen from these leaked Pentagon documents, the US and the Pentagon Defense Intelligence Agency is acknowledging that there aren't very good prospects for their counteroffensive. Zelensky's begging for weapons. The cemeteries are filling up across Ukraine. There aren't enough skilled officers and veteran fighters. Uh, pressure is being put on men across Ukraine to enlist. They're being forcibly conscripted. This is a story the U.S. media is covering up. And now Politico is even reporting, citing U.S. officials, who would I, I would assume people in the Biden administration, saying that the prospects are bleak for some dramatic counteroffensive that will extend the war. So what happens then? The European countries that have been suffering through this energy crisis are going to start putting pressure on Ukraine to negotiate and the endless war that the militarists about around Biden have fantasized about, which is costing U.S. taxpayers $61,000 a day, sorry, a minute, a minute mm. for military aid that's over $35 billion of military aid so far, will eventually have to come to an ignominious end. Right. And Given that it is so clear that that's where things are headed, why on earth won't the Biden administration um, prepare for that eventuality, that, that unavoidable eventuality, and make or push or support some kind of ceasefire or peace deal now? Wouldn't that just be the obvious thing to do if we're, we're just heading to the precipice of disaster anyway? Yeah, it really, to the average American taxpayer, makes no sense. And that's why we're seeing so much outrage and resonance of this issue within the Democratic Party with RFK Jr.'s candidacy. And though I, I have to chalk it up to ideology, to fanaticism among the people around Biden, from Victoria Newland at the State Department and Tony Blinken, who actually wrote his... Uh, graduate thesis on the destruction of the Russian Siberian pipeline, which kind of set the stage for the Nord Stream pipeline. And then you have Jake Sullivan at the NSC. I mean, these are real hawkish ideologues. Susan Rice, I mean, she was one of the architects of the Libyan regime change operation that destabilized a large part of North Africa. She was his domestic policy advisor. Uh, they're not looking 
at the reality on the ground. And then you have NATO itself. For NATO, it would be humiliating to have to make territorial concessions to Russia when they were pushing right up against Russia's frontiers. And then you have all of the beltway bandits in Washington who are profiteering off this war. I mean, the people who I see in Washington in affluent neighborhoods with Ukrainian flags over their townhomes, they have literal skin, well, not literal skin, but they have figurative skin in the game here. They're, they're working for Lockheed Martin, or they're in the administration, or they're at the Pentagon. So there are those forces that are acting against the will of the average American taxpayer right now. I mean, what do you make of the statement um, that was made at the UN about the use of the IMF um, as a kind of uh, arm of imperialism to ex exert Western control over various other countries? Can you unpack that, that argument for us here? Yeah, no, that's a really important point. If you remember Joe Biden's first trip to Kiev in February 2015, he actually said, I directed the IMF to give loans to this new government. This was a coup government that had come in after toppling a democratically elected leader. It was the nationalist government that was going to eventually be used as a proxy to make war against Russia. And the IMF was Biden's personal tool, as he said, to prop up this regime. And, you know, flash forward to today, where the U.S. government is going around the world seizing the bank accounts of wealthy Russians in violation of law and due process simply because they're Russian. And as Lavrov said, this violates the principle of globalization. So what they're doing, I mean, what just happened at the UN, the Russian journalists were stripped of their visas by the host country in violation of US rules. They were not allowed to enter. So the US is creating a new iron curtain here. And what Lavrov is saying is that with the end of globalization, we are going to see a new process where all the countries that have been left out of this process will get together, specifically Russia and China, and begin to form a new and very powerful bloc, which will lead to the end of unipolar U.S. hegemony and the end of dollar dominance over the global economy. That's already happening at a rapid rate right before our eyes. I mean, it does seem like that's happening with the writing is on the wall. We're seeing uh, the many member countries in the global south expressing their frustration with being coerced to support the war in Ukraine. You see these statements from, you know, people who are well admired, especially in the left of the United States, like Lula in Brazil, making similar kinds of statements. And yet the United States' posture on this seems to be to double down. What do you think their end game is? There is no end game. I mean, the U.S. can only continue to escalate unless um, sane, rational forces take the reins of power. I mean, we're hearing from militaristic members of Congress and in the think tank sector that the reason the U.S. needs to fight Russia over there in Ukraine is to prevent China from fighting Taiwan. In other words, we're, they're, they're going to pivot next to a conflict with Taiwan. And I think that's, that's the next phase here. And if you look at the war games, I mean, the exercises that... Uh, CSIS, this think tank in D.C., ran around a U.S.-China conflict. Tens of thousands of U.S. service members died. Uh, several uh, aircraft carriers and major battle groups were sunk. This would cause an existential crisis for the U.S. from which it would never recover, and yet they're preparing for it. It's a, an incredibly dangerous scenario. And meanwhile, the rest of the world, including Saudi Arabia, uh, which just a few years ago had its leadership dance with the U.S. president with swords, is moving on. Saudi Arabia selling oil to China and Yuan. Saudi Arabia is engaged in a peace process with Iran, completely shattering the whole U.S. strategic, uh, the, the, the entire U.S. strategy for dominating the Middle East. And that peace accord was brokered by China. Hmm. Max, so much. thank you so much for joining us. We really appreciate it. Thanks a lot, Robbie.